We are recording. We are officially started. Let's go ahead and uh, do get started. Um, thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, topic that we're going to be uh, exploring this afternoon is uh, the role of um, online discussions, and we'll we'll look a little bit at synchronous, but mostly asynchronous online discussions. Again, um, the way we think about Online discussions can really help us um, navigate that blend between synchronous and asynchronous um, uh, uh, um, directions for our remote classes in particular. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And um, get rid of some of these Zoom windows so I can actually see what's going on. What I want to do today is to um, spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some, not theoretical, but just some frameworks about thinking about online discussions. Um, the workshop was billed at looking at the Moodle form activity, which I do want to go to in some depth because no matter what learning management system you use, the um, you know, online discussion forums are an important part for doing certainly online courses and I think for our remote classes as well. There are some ways we can think about using VoiceThread uh, mm -hmm. to support class discussions. Um, let's say some things about... I am I not coming through, Marie? Mm -hmm. I can hear you just fine, Keith. Okay. So, um, yeah, and um, we can talk a little bit about how some of the, the ways we can think about using uh, discussion in our Zoom sessions for our remote classes. Uh, and many of you probably already have some some experience to bring to the table around that. I don't know that we'll have time to actually add this other topic, but uh, we've added a, a new new functionality to Moodle that allows um, allows a social annotation of course readings and so forth. And I think that has some um, opportunities to be another source of having conversations around the course materials. So. Um, let me just point you to think about these these areas when you're thinking about how you can use uh, discussions, online discussions in your classes. Uh, you want to think about what what role or what functions you want those online discussions to play in your course. Um, I've got some resources that we won't take the time to go through in depth that you can um, follow the links uh, from this document later that will uh, provide you some ways of thinking about how you know what some of the best practices are of incorporating online discussions into your remote classes and then um, ideally you'll want to have the discussions the online discussions count for something, mean something, and so there are some issues about how you are going to evaluate or grade participation in the online discussions. And I've, I, I don't think we'll take time to go through these in detail at all, but I do have some links here out to online discussion rubric um, examples that you can, can take a look at. But I do just want to make a few comments about um, different roles that online discussion can play in our online and remote classes. Um, and I think I want to maybe start down here and to get you to think about, um, again, this mix between synchronous and asynchronous discussion activities. So certainly for those of us who are teaching remotely and we have a scheduled time for our um, our classes to meet, we can think about what balance of presentation, discussion, group work, other uh, activities can, can take place in our Zoom sessions and how best to maximize what's going on with those discussions. 
But the other tools we can talk about today will allow you to think about moving some of that course discussions um, beyond just that face-to-face -face time, that remote face-to-face -face time perhaps, uh, and think about how you can bring up, incorporate uh, discussion before class and after class. One of the things we're all going to have to be dealing with for our remote classes in the fall is how to build a sense of community. And um, I'm actually not modeling best practices here, I just realized, because given the amount of stuff I'm trying to cram into the session, I've just kind of jumped in. And so we haven't taken time to, to build a, a sense of uh, community in this workshop here. But um, we, for our remote classes, we're going to have to think about for situations where we haven't met face to face with our students, how do we begin to develop a, that sense of community? Um, for um, you know, for those of you who maybe have uh, developed online classes in the past, but certainly when when I work with faculty to develop online classes, very important to have some kind of low stakes icebreaker activities that can build a sense of community. And oftentimes those rely around, um, you know, online discussions. Um, one framework that we use quite a bit um, is this community of inquiry framework, which I think I will actually take the time to go out to. Um, this, this is a, a long-standing framework that is uh, very popularly used in thinking about developing online classes, but I think it re relates to our remote instruction classes as well. And, um, you know, there are these three presences that the model talks about. You know, teaching presence is how you have designed um, the course to allow students to be able to have meaningful educational uh, opportunities cognitive presence, the ability to which you set up situations where students can construct meaning. But for certainly for online classes and for our remote classes, this social presence is very important as well. And you know, this is the ability for all of us that are participating in the class to uh, you know, feel like we are a member of the class, that we're a part of this uh, community of learners. And so as we're thinking about how to develop social presence for our fall remote classes, uh, it'll be very um, useful to think about how you can facilitate initial low stakes welcoming conversations among your class that will get them to begin to know each other as individuals, um, that everyone can have a, a social presence in the in the remote kind of in, remote instruction kind of environment that we're going to be dealing with, so that they they feel like they are you know contributing to some uh, some community. So um, maybe just a couple of other things to pull out of here. Some of these things we'll actually touch on when we actually look at uh, some of the tools later, but I think increasingly this issue of how we can use online discussion to promote a more inclusive and equitable um, classroom is important. Uh, even in our face-to-face -face classes, um, I know when I do um, discussions in my face-to-face -face classes, you know, it's very easy for those, uh, for those classroom discussions to be monopolized by a handful of voices, those students who are are into that mode, you know, ready to to step up and and um, you know share their thoughts and so forth. But that's not everyone in the class. And um, I actually wasn't teaching this last spring. I was helping faculty, you know, pivot their courses to remote instruction. But I know many of uh, the faculty I, I I worked with had the issue where you know pivoting the remote instruction through the Zoom sessions was a good choice. It, it allowed us to continue our courses, but it wasn't a great choice necessarily for all of the students in our classes. And some of them 
you know, some of them just um, drifted further and further away from the class. So by adding some of these asynchronous discussion opportunities, giving more people, more students, and encouraging more students in the, in the class to express their voice, I think has some important, um, some important equity issues. But I don't want to spend too much time on this background stuff because we've got a lot of nuts and bolts to go through. But let me just point you to a couple of other resources here, and then uh, I'll be a little bit better host, and I'll uh, stop sh screen sharing for a couple minutes, and we can see if there's any any questions at this point. Um, I, th I think this 10 tips for effective online discussions is a good one for you to go take a look at later. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of the, the main points here. It's going to be very important for you to convey to your students what your expectations are for them uh, in the online discussions. I mean, that's important for our face-to-face -face discussions as well, but it's a lot e easier in the face-to-face -face environment to um, get those expectations across in various kinds of nonverbal and you know just classroom management kinds of ways for our uh, remote instruction classes and online classes you might need to be a little bit more prescriptive and spell things out you know in the syllabus and so forth uh, some you know low stakes easy discussions that will bring the students into the online conversation space. And this works you know, really well with having the idea of, well, having some icebreakers to get the students um, involved in the class. Uh, one thing you're all gonna have to think about is how much presence you need to have in especially the asynchronous online discussions. Um, and I think in general, you want to, you want to find your sweet spot in the middle somewhere. You don't want to be absent from any of your online dis uh, asynchronous discussions because then students, uh, can easily get lost and, um, you know, feel like, you know, why am I discussing here if the instructor's not there? But on the other hand, you don't want to be jumping into every conversation that gets posted immediately onto you know the discussion forums or whatever because if you're too involved in the online discussions then you're going to get much less of the student to student discussion going on let's see what else tracking participation there are ways of doing that in moodle and VoiceThread. Uh, obviously create questions you care about and so forth so i mean th this is a good resource i think to go through later uh, this one as well, but we're really not going to go through this in detail. This is a whole chapter from a um, uh, an openly licensed textbook from the Lumen Learning Library in OER text that uh, can give you a lot of things to think about as you're thinking about your online discussions. Just a couple of things. Um, again, this idea of instructor presence, how much and not, and not too much, setting expectations, making the discussions worth something. One thing that you might want to think about that um, might not be immediately um, evident is to know when to wrap up a particular discussion. Uh, so part of the expectations is you know making it clear when you want students to participate in each of the online discussion opportunities, especially for the asynchronous opportunities. And a good um, a good practice is you know if you're going to spend the first three days of the week allowing students to discuss back and forth on a discussion forum over some course topic. At the end, you probably, as the instructor, well, in addition to kind of carefully guiding and and coaxing the discussion during the first part of the week, it's probably a good idea for you to say, okay, we've had a great discussion here. Here are the, some of the main points, and and uh, re reflect that back to the class. Um, 
Um, I've got some net, netiquette examples here and, as I said, some links to discussion rubrics. So uh, if you can think about the, you know, the rubric that you're going to be doing to evaluate student performance on these discussion opportunities, then uh, I would recommend you just even just share those out to the students. So again, it makes those expectations clear. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point and um, you know, see if there are any comments or questions that people want to raise at this point. I think you want to think about how discussion played a role in your face-to-face -face classes and to what extent you want that, those same roles to be reflected in online discussions in your remote instruction classes or whether you're going to need discussion to take on new roles for your classes. Um. Can yeah, we Susan. just ask a question? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're a small enough group, okay. I think. Um, oh, and Nancy, you've got your hand up, I see as well. Okay. So my question is, I teach dance composition. Yep. And so in a sense, some of the conversations between students happen with the movement. Um, and I'm wondering whether there's any way on Zoom to unpin more than one person at a time. Like, mm. can I have just two or three Your people? options in Zoom are either the gallery view, which I've got you all in now, or the speaker view. Um, there's not really uh, a way that you could have, and I've gotten this question from theater folks as well. I mean, could we have a Zoom session where there were three talking heads that were pinned and, um, uh, that's really not an option in Zoom. I've looked around. I haven't, I haven't found anything. Um, there are some other tools that you, we can think about, um, but I don't have them off the top of my head. Um, uh, Marie, what was that? Was that Discourse? No, Discord? Discord. Does that support video chats or was that just text chat? I believe it's just text chat, but uh, I mean, we can look into it. I yep. don't know, not having used Yeah. Uh, let's see, Monica, was that, did you have a question? Okay. So uh, what I want to do is provide some nuts and bolts for those, uh, you know, those three tools. Uh, the Moodle discussion forum is really geared around asynchronous text-based conversations um, and um, in general that that's a, has that kind of approach has always been a very important workhorse for um, providing a way for students to interact with each other and with you and with the content in these online remote courses um, We'll say a few things about VoiceThread and then uh, finish off with talking about um, some aspects of uh, managing conversations in Zoom. So in terms of the um, Moodle discussion forum activity, uh, it's a pretty straightforward and easy activity to use, but there are some things that I, I do want to point out. Uh, as I've mentioned, um, online discussion forums have been key for online learning for forever. And I think what I want to do is to just take some time to go through setting up a Moodle discussion forum, but I will let me bounce back and forth here you know, between a couple of tabs. You know, if you are wanting to add a discussion forum to your, or multiple discussion forums to your Moodle space to do some of this asynchronous online discussions, um, it's called forum activity in Moodle. It's called discussion in other, in some other LMSs, but basically, yeah, the key points are here that um, 
you're providing an environment where students can have an ongoing conversation. It is not real time, it is asynchronous. Uh, so this allows you know, the conversation to expand beyond just a particular time when students are together either you know, online at, at a given time. And um, let me just expand all of the settings here so that we can go through. And I'll just call this one workshop example. The first key point I want to make is that there are actually five different kinds of discussion forum in Moodle. So Moodle is pretty rich in terms of the discussion forum um, opportunities. And um, the default, this standard forum for general use is not necessarily the best discussion forum for you to use for a particular discussion in your class. So I do wanna spend a little bit of time talking about what each of these is, is about. And I have examples of all of them actually set up already in my sandbox here. And we can go through from the faculty view and the student view what these look like. But basically, you should look at the discussion forum activity as um, an activity that it can contain one or more separate discussion threads. And a discussion thread is just somebody starts a conversation and then others have the ability to reply to those, uh, to what's been posted in that conversation. These different types of Moodle discussion forums vary in terms of how many separate discussions can there be in the forum, who can start them, uh, and how many can someone start, who can reply. Well, basically, everyone can reply to whatever is up there, whether you're a student or instructor. But some of the different forums have limitations over um, you know, who can reply when. So as I said, this, this standard forum um, for general use is actually, in my opinion, not the best option for discussing actual course topics. Um, this is the most generic um, discussion forum. It's a container where anyone in the class, faculty or student, can start as many separate discussions in that um, discussion forum as they want. And then anyone can immediately reply to any of the discussion threads that are started. So if you were to use a standard discussion, a standard forum for, um, for a topic like, uh, you know, I want you just to discuss how the material in chapter 13 relates to the issues that we discussed last week in our Zoom session. You would have the situation where, you know, Susan might come in and start a discussion thread around that topic. And then Frank might come in and he might, he might reply to what Susan started in her discussion thread, but he might start his own thread and so on and so forth. So the, the standard form it can really become very disjointed for a course for when you're ta discussing that kind of, of topic in the course. I find this uh, standard forum is most useful for things like, um, you know, I've, I oftentimes will set up um, a discussion forum that I'll call student lounge. And in this general uh, standard forum, um, Anyone in any student in the class who's got some topic that they want to throw out to discuss can, can start that up as a discussion topic. And one or, you know, anyone who else is in the class can reply to that. Um, another way I, I use the standard forum is instead of a student lounge, I might say, you know, ask your course questions here. Create a an ungraded uh, standard forum 
where anyone who has a, a question, any of the students who have a question or observation about the class, as long as it doesn't deal with private you know, information, obviously, I encourage them to ask that on the discussion forum in class. You know, rather than the student having a question about the class and then emailing me that question and me replying back to that one student by email and answering the question for the one student, if I encourage students instead to ask the questions on this, you know, course questions forum, then I can answer them or maybe even some other student in the class can answer the question and everyone in the class will see the answer. So rather than you getting you know, eight questions about the same uh, issue with the course, hopefully, you know, it can be asked once on the forum and um, everyone will see the answer there and it'll cut down on your, um, on your um, email traffic. I find these two forums, the best ones for the kinds of course discussions that you would generally want your discussion forums to um, to do. So um, the single simple discussion is really great when there is kind of an open-ended topic you just want the class to discuss. Uh, with a single simple discussion, there is only one discussion thread, and that's the discussion thread that you start by um, setting up the description for the discussion forum. So you pose the prompt that you want the class to, to talk about, and um, you know Susan comes in and she will read your prompt and she can hit reply and add, add her her um, voice to the to the discussion and then George comes in and he will see your prompt and he will see forgetting names already Susan's reply and would be able to read both of those and to reply either to your original prompt or to what Susan had and so this creates this single unified open-ended discussion um, around this this course uh, topic and so you know what that would look like from your perspective as the instructor is um, you know you create this and then you know here I describe a situation in the past where your participation in course led to a significant insight and so forth there's no right or wrong answer here um, the hopefully each student is going to contribute um, a reflection on their experience and how it relates to the course and then follow-up comments on the other reflections that students have done so you want that conversation to take place in one in one discussion thread you don't want to have to have students have to go back and forth between Frank's this initial reflection and Susan's initial reflection and all the replies that have gone down for each of those so again single simple discussion that's really great for these open-ended discussions um, if you are dealing with for example you want students to answer questions over the reading and then discuss each other's answers um, you may have more of a right or wrong answer there and you don't want the first student to come in to answer the question correctly and then shut down the discussion and so that's where this Q&A forum is useful. So um, with the Q&A forum, you have the ability as the instructor to set up the discussion forum. And then you are the only one who can add new discussion threads. And so if, um, if, um, I've added already a couple of questions on chapter 12 and I want to add a third question. I would say, you know, here's question three. And here's question three. I'm not going to actually try to come up with an interesting question. 
and you as the instructor are the only one who can you know add those discussion threads and we'll see later what this looks like from a student viewpoint but essentially uh, when Susan comes in here she can look to see what question number one is and she can respond to question number one and if Frank comes in later and goes to answer question number one um, until he has answered question number one he won't see what Susan has answered and so each student in a Q&A forum basically gets their own blank slate their own you know clean um, slate to answer the question and then once they do they can come in and uh, have a conversation about their answers um, the others um, th are more specialized um, each person posts one discussion. I think that can be useful for peer review. Uh, I won't take the time to talk about it, but in this, each student has the ability to start a discussion thread, and it could be, here's my paper, here's, uh, um, here's a little summary of my paper and what I want feedback on, and I'll attach my paper to it. I can start my discussion thread there, and then other students can view um, you know what the first student had posted and provide feedback through the you know posting uh, replies um, so uh, when you are setting up a discussion forum you want to decide you know what makes the most sense do you want an open-ended discussion um, and then in that case the here's the discussion prompt your description of the forum would become the start of that conversation. Um, and a lot of these settings you don't need to worry about. Uh, I will talk a little bit about subscription and tracking though. Um, you have the ability if you want to force everyone to get an email every time someone posts something to a discussion forum. Probably not a popular setting if it's a very active discussion forum. You can, um, you can disable that email feature if you want. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. The optional uh, subscription basically allows students to decide whether or not they want to be notified and in the version of Moodle we're running now and for actually for several versions uh, in the past, not only can you subscribe to a um, discussion forum where you get notified by, for every, um, every activity on that forum, but you can also subscribe to individual discussion topic threads. So uh, that's a good way to you know, keep people engaged if they're, oh, there's some new activity on the discussion forum. I, I want to go in and, and reply to that. Um, in terms of grading uh, discussion forum uh, participation, you have the ability to turn on um, a rating scale for so that you can provide a rating for each individual uh, discussion forum post. Um, that has some nice features in that as you're reading through the discussion forum, you can just go ahead and provide, you know, put uh, numeric scores on the posts. But it can be kind of difficult to figure out how to actually combine all of those into a grade. So um, you can specify what the maximum grade is, but you know, if you do average of ratings and let's say you're doing like a five point scale and one student does five excellent posts and you give them a five for each of them and they do one so-so post and you give them a two. Um, and then you've got another student who does one great post and they get a five for that. The student who did the one great post at five actually gets a higher score than um, than um, the student who did five good posts and one mediocre post 
So there's some some complications to think through. If you are interested in, in doing this ratings uh, approach, uh, contact me and we can work through it. I tend to leave ratings off most of the time and just kind of read through uh, all of the posts for each of the students and give them kind of a holistic, it's a 10 point uh, activity. You know, I'll give them a more holistic, uh, you know, Susan did a work. I'm going to give her a 9.5 out of 10 on the discussion forum. Um, other, you know, just kind of standard Moodle settings. And I don't think we'll take the time to talk about activity completion. In this case, I've created a another single simple discussion forum. So if I click save again, it's going to um, have a container for discussion that has just the one conversation in it. Um, what this looks like from the student perspective is if I'm in here as sample student two, if I go to the student lounge, um, I have the ability to add a new discussion topic and, uh, you know, Chapter 12 questions. What were we supposed to read about? <laughs> you know, whatever question that um, the students uh, want to post. Uh, they can start a, they can post that to the discussion forum. It becomes a new uh, discussion posting and then anyone sees this if you answer the question other students in the class can see the answer to that question or maybe um, you know like I say maybe Craig will come in here and answer the question so there's there's that that's the the standard that's the default forum type the open-ended discussion from a student perspective they will see your prompt for starting off the discussion, and all they have to, uh, all they can do basically is to reply. And uh, you know, if, uh, if I put in this kind of nonsensical reply, you can see that I have the option to be subscribed or not to the discussion. So if I don't want to get an email every time someone posts something here or a summary of the daily posts. If I've set my Moodle account that way, I can unselect that. Uh, replies and initial discussion threads can have attachments and so forth. I will post that to the forum. And now if I come in as a third, as a second student, um, I can come in here to the open-ended discussion. And I'll see that, um, you know, here's, here's the initial prompt from my instructor. Here's what sample student two added. I can reply either to the initial prompt or to the, um, to the first reply. I can view these posts either in the default nested form or I could do a threaded view of the discussion where I've got the initial prompt and then just a list of the, a, a threaded list of the uh, follow-up replies. I could do a chronological view with the um, newest activity at the top. However, I want to look at the, um, at the replies on the forum. Um, just quickly for, the Q&A form, because I think that's the other one that you're going to uh, make use of a lot. So um, it says it's the Q&A answer forum. If you want to see the responses to these questions, you must first post your answer. So I can come in here and I can do a reply. and post that to the forum again if uh and that that was for question one if i come in here as um 
sample student five to the chapter 12 forum. I will see that um, there are these three questions started by my instructor. Um, these two obviously just have uh, the unread prompts from the instructor and no replies. This forum actually has a reply. So if I go in to look at question one, I will see that um, somebody replied. I don't see who. I don't see what they replied. I've got to answer the question first. And, um, and submit my response to the question. And at this point, I can still actually go in and edit my post as a student. And so Moodle's actually not going to show me the previous responses until this edit period has, has passed. So I, what I would recommend is you have your students come in, answer the questions that you've set up on the forum, then just you know, go away and come back later. By the time they come back, uh, all of the other activity will have been unlocked and they can see the full conversation around the questions and, and um, add additional replies to other student replies. Okay, so that is, I think, uh, enough to get you all started well with the discussion forum activity. Um, I won't go into great detail on VoiceThread because I do want to spend some time talking about uh, Zoom discussions, but I will just say that, um, I, I, I don't know, how many of you um, are using, for example, VoiceThread for, um, for doing presentations to your students. Um, that's what most faculty have been using VoiceThread for. Uh, but you can actually set up your VoiceThreads so that uh, students can actually re reply back or make comments on, your, uh, on the VoiceThreads that you set up. For your lecture VoiceThreads, you may not want students commenting. Although you could, you know, uh, have it a, uh, provide a way for students to be able to, um, you know, ask questions on your your asynchronous VoiceThread lectures, so that you can come back and answer those questions. But you might have a situation where you want the students to discuss uh, material that you're presenting on some VoiceThread uh, slides. So I'll just quickly go through how that would work. There are a couple of options. You can, you can make that into a required comments graded activity, which I don't think will take the time to, to look at for today. I think I'll, I'll do the easier one where um, I'm just providing some slides with some images on them and I want the students to talk about the material on those slides. Uh, so uh, you would do that by um, adding a voice through the activity. You know, call it uh, comment on these slides. I'm not going to make it a graded assignment, so I'm going to unselect the option to accept grades from the tool. And once I create that assignment, um, when I first, as the instructor, go into that activity, then Moodle is, or VoiceThread is going to ask me what kind of a VoiceThread it should be. I'm going to point them to an individual VoiceThread that I want them to comment on. And actually, let me just quickly create a new one. Uh, to show you some um, some things here, so I'm going to just go pick out some pick out some slides from the New York Public Library. Uh, just get four or five slides here, import those into my VoiceThread, 
um, and YPL slides. Um, when you are creating your voice thread, uh, you want and you want students to comment on it. You need to look at the playback options. And so, if you've been working with play with VoiceThread before, you may not have actually looked at the playback options. Here is one place to do that. But I will, um, you know, I'll do it here. Um, you can decide whether or not you want students to be able to add slides to the slide deck that you've put together. Maybe I don't want that to happen. Um, you do want to make sure that you have selected at least one of these comment modes for students to be able to do uh, comments on the voice thread because if these are all unselected, they're not going to have the option to do commenting. So. Uh, I'll just sit, leave microphone, webcam, and text selected as the options. Uh, maybe I'll enable threaded commenting as well because we're talking about really doing discussions. If I click save, um, then I have created this uh, little five five slide presentation. I've actually not made any comments myself on there. I'm just going to share this with the class. And then um, from the student perspective, we come in here and um, look at this, you know, comment on these slides. I would be able to go in here and um, I would see, I would see the first slide, but I could look at any of the slides in here. And um, because I have some commenting modalities uh, that have been selected for me as a student, I can click here and I can add a text comment on the slide. And then it shows up here as sample student five made this comment. And if I select another slide, as a student, I can come in here and record an audio comment. So here is my comment on this slide, and I'm going to pull up a pencil so that I can point to the fruit that this particular monkey is uh, working on. Stop the recording and uh, save that and then that also becomes a, a comment. Now if um, I close this out and close down the tab I have as sample student 5 made a couple of comments on this uh, presentation. If I come in here as um, sample student 2 and look at that same one. Um, I will see the slides and I will see that there are some slides that have some comments on them. And um, I can look at sample student one comment here. Come on. And because my instructor has enabled threaded comments, I can actually add a comment to the previous comment using any of these modalities. So maybe I'll turn on my webcam. Um, oh, right, I'm in Safari. Uh, the webcam works best in um, Chrome and Firefox, so I'll just do a a text comment just to show you how the threaded comments work. And now um, uh, 
I've got um, actually because of the webcam thing. Yeah, so my comment is, uh, you know, attached to the previous students' comments, and these can be private comments or they can be public comments. Public comments are viewed by, you know, anyone else in the class. Private ones just go to the original student. So there is a bit of a robust uh, commenting functionality in, uh, in VoiceThread if you want to use it that way. One thing that um, I think might be of, of interest to uh, a number of faculty who use video is that you can actually put a video onto a VoiceThread slide. Either it's a video you can upload to the VoiceThread that you're creating, or what I did in this case was to create a VoiceThread slide that I just... Um, use the URL to a YouTube video and put that in, and and uh, VoiceThread basically captures that YouTube video. Now as um, sample student two, I can actually come over here. Um, come on to a particular point in the video. And you know, with with the uh, with the scrubber there, come on. If I well, you know, you get you get the you get the timeline scrubber where you want, or you just play the video and stop it when you want to make a comment as a. As a student, if I can get this stuff out of the way, I can um, I can add a comment. That I will attach. Yeah, don't show me that again. To a specific time point in the video. And so you could certainly set up a discussion forum in Moodle and embed that YouTube video as the prompt in the discussion forum and then in, in the replies in the, in the Moodle discussion forum, students could talk about the uh, different aspects of the video. But with this commenting feature in, um, in VoiceThread and the ability to attach the comments on a specific point in the video, you can have the um, the conversation tied to uh, you know the specific uh, aspects that are being discussed at the different times in the video. Okay. So that's uh, that's something that might be of, of interest to a number of faculty who are are using video, um, and then. In the time we have left, because I do want to be sensitive for people's time, let me just make a couple of comments about um, about Zoom. Um, boy, what can I do justice to? Uh, we probably at this point all have examples or experience doing um, conversations in Zoom, so I maybe won't do a lot of discussion about this. Uh, clearly the, the size of our class makes a difference how we manage this. Um, let me, um, you know, if you've got a small enough class, I've, I've worked with faculty who, you know, have a reasonably sized class. They just tell everyone in the class to switch to a uh, gallery view so that everyone can pretty much see everyone, you know, have everyone turn their webcams on, assuming that they've got webcams, and can have a fairly decent full class discussion that way. If you've got a larger 
class, obviously that can become unmanageable um, quite quickly. So just as with our faculty at large meetings or our college senate meetings, we make use of the raised hand feature to manage who can discuss next. You know, there there is that. Um, then one interesting feature about conversations in Zoom is that you've got a couple of different uh, channels for having that take place, and so you can have you can have conversation going on in the chat, which there is going on right now in the background while I'm not paying attention to it. And so um, as instructors, if you're going to have your students, you know, using the chat feature while you're presenting or while you're you know, dealing with, um, you know, uh, questions by having uh, students raise their hand, it's a good, um, um, practice to assign one of your students to monitor the chat. So uh, Marie is my student chat monitor uh, for this session here. So I could periodically, which I haven't done as what, much as I should have, go to Marie and say, is there anything in the chat that I need to address? Not at this time. Okay. Um, in terms of main room discussions, there are a couple other tools which I'm not sure whether they really fit into the into the discussion framework or not. Um, but you could um, you could use the nonverbal feedback tools as uh, or the polling function to augment discussions you're having um, take place in um, in the main room. So you could be having an ongoing conversation about something, and then you just want a quick read of you know, who's agreeing with one position or the other. You can have uh, people use the, you know, the check marks or the X's to vote yes or no, or you could take the time to set up a specific poll. All of these, while not discussion per se, can augment um, the discussions you are having in Zoom. And uh, I'm going to stop my sharing for a minute so I can look at the um, the participants window. For those of you who have used breakout sessions, go to the participant window and click yes. And for those of you who don't have experience using the breakouts, click the no button. And looks like so far we're pretty much split half and half. Maybe a few more faculty who haven't used the breakout sessions. Um, for those of you who can stay around for like five more minutes, um, I just want to show you, especially for those of you who haven't um, been involved in um, using breakouts, what it's, what it's going to look like. And of course, one issue with demonstrating Zoom while I'm in a Zoom session is that uh, I really can't show you real time what's going on. So I'm going to take a couple of screen captures as I'm setting up breakout rooms. And uh, when you are managing your Zoom session, um, you should have an option down at the bottom of the screen for doing breakout rooms. It might be under the dot, dot, dot more option, depending on how many tools you've got showing up down at the bottom of the screen. And if you select the break, I'm, I'm going to verbally describe it and then show the screenshots later. If you uh, select the breakout room option, you basically can have Zoom automatically and randomly assign uh, people to uh, breakout rooms. You specify how many rooms you want. So I've got 27 participants on the call right now. If I select five breakout rooms, there's going to be five or six of you in each room. And um, I can probably just in the instant in the um, just to save time, I think that's what I will do. But I will mention that you can manually uh, create the rooms. And then uh, I could manually create five rooms. And then I could specify you know, who's going to room one, who's going to room two, who's going to room three. If you have 
you know, if you have uh, team-based learning or you've got other established groups that you're going to you're using in your class, you probably want to manually assign people to them. So uh, we'll just spend a couple of minutes in the breakout rooms. Uh, so what I've done is I've selected the breakout room tool. I have selected automatically create five breakout rooms. Uh, you will automatically be assigned to one of the five rooms. When I click uh, create the breakout rooms button, you will all get an invitation to go to your room. And then, uh, so all the rooms are going to be open, and um, you should have been have received an invitation to go to a room. Uh, we'll just spend a minute or two in there. You can see what it looks like. So it looks like most everyone, Marie, has moved into their rooms. Uh, and uh, let me just demonstrate. You can. So I'm just popping in for a couple minutes to show you that as instructor, you can pop into the room. And then if I leave the room, see you later, uh, I'll go back to the main room. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, all right. When I'm looking at the bottom right now, I don't ha see that breakout thing. Is no, because you're not host. Because I'm not host. Okay. So when when you are hosting your own meetings, you'll see you know the record button. You'll see the security button, so that you can control who can share and who can't share. You'll see the breakout room button. Um, and some other things that you don't see currently as participants. So, um, okay. yeah, I, um, so when you were in your breakout rooms, I did from the main room broadcast a couple of messages to all the breakout rooms. So there is that functionality. Um, I didn't, given the time uh, that we're already over time, I did not actually go into each of the rooms but as host you can go from the main room to any of your rooms to see how the conversation is going and then go back to the main room so clearly i mean this breakout room functionality is very useful for mimicking the kind of situation we do in our face-to-face -face classes where we want some small group discussion first for you know students to um to have a, a um, an easier environment for them to discuss some of the uh, some of the concepts in the class and to come up with some you know specific things to report back and then we report back. So the breakout room functionality in Zoom is uh, is very useful. Um, I mean, just some good practices for that. Uh, yeah, Maria copied into the chat. Um, some information about uh, managing breakout rooms, but um, 
pedagogically, if you're going to use breakout rooms, you should probably do it a little bit more intentionally than I did at the at the end of the workshop here. Um, it's a good idea to send your students into the breakout rooms with a clear idea of what you want them to to discuss in their small groups in their breakout rooms, and also. Um, it can be a good idea to have uh, specific deliverables that you want them to produce at the end of their breakout discussion to bring back to the to the room. That can be the same uh, the same thing for all rooms, but you could you know you could say, well, room one, I want you, I want the four of you to really focus in on this aspect of the argument that the author was making in the text. And I want you to evaluate this question, and I want you to come back with a response to that question. So that each breakout room can have a different focus, depending on how you want to arrange those, those small group discussions. Um, and then, uh, as I said, you can, you can broadcast messages to all of the, the breakout rooms so that you can uh, have a one-way communication to the students at, when they're in the room. You can spend time going around to the rooms to see how the conversation is going. Typically, when you decide to close the breakout rooms, uh, students get a 60 second warning. So you should have all seen a 60 second warning saying, you know, the room is closing down. You, um, um, you, um, you have the next 60 seconds to return back to the main room. So, uh, this can be a, a very powerful way to kind of segment and manage the, the discussions that you want to do real time, live synchronous discussions, but also think about, you know, some of these other tools where you can bring in asynchronous discussion conversations to kind of broaden out the scope for conversations in your classes. And uh, I'm already over time in terms of our time together today. Um, I, will, uh, I will get caught up on getting follow-ups to all of the workshops we've been doing over the last three or four weeks. Uh, that's my job for the weekend is to send out you know, follow-ups for, uh, for this workshop. I'll send out a follow-up um, that will provide um, you know, links to the recording once it's up on our YouTube channel and to the lecture notes. Uh, we'll put together some, um, some help links for um, the Moodle discussion forum, for VoiceThread specifically about doing discussions, and for Zoom, managing discussions in Zoom. Uh, there'll be a link to a... Um, um, workshop evaluation form that I've got up online, as well as information about how to, uh, you know, contact uh, academic affairs about documenting attendance if you still are in a situation where you're needing to do that. So, um, I know I tried to pack a lot in here. Um, we will um, probably, as the summer goes on, we had uh, more, um, we, we, we've had full workshops on pretty much all these tools and we'll repeat them as well again. Um, as always, we're, we're looking for the workshop topics that you will find most useful. So if you've got ideas about workshops that you want us to do, you know, just go ahead and send them to tlpc at purchase.edu or the workshop evaluation form also has a place where you can say, you know, I'd really like to see a workshop on this topic or that topic and we'll, we'll bring them up and fit them into the schedule. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop the recording.